Hi, everyone. Uh, today I'm joined with Parker. Parker is a third year dental student at Columbia University's College of Dental Medicine. He's here today. We're going to talk a little bit about his experience getting into dental school, what Columbia looks for in its applicants, and what it's like being a student there. So thanks so, so much, Parker. Yeah, thanks for having me, Joel. So first, a little bit of backstory. Everyone has a different stimulus that kind of led them towards the dental path. What drove you to dentistry? Did you consider any other careers? And how did you eventually narrow it down that you wanted to pursue dentistry specifically? Sure. Um, I, I originally went into college knowing that I liked science. So I went in and I, I pretty soon decided to be a neuroscience major. And uh, so I, I was, I was kind of between medicine and dentistry just because I, I wanted to find a career that had some barrier to entry. Like not everybody can do it. Um, Cause I feel like that provided job security. And then on top of that, I shadowed dentists. I spoke to doctors that I knew as I investigated dentistry more and more and and other, you know, specialties within dentistry, pediatrics and, and oral surgery specifically, I felt like I really liked having a skill. I felt like, you know, between medicine and dentistry, there are so few parts of medicine where you have like a, an actual hand skill, an actual practice, a lot of it's, a lot of it's intellectual and cerebral, which I appreciate, but I, I also wanted to have not only a cerebral understanding, but I also wanted to have some sort of skill. So, so I felt like everything in dentistry, no matter what you do, you usually have some sort of hand skill that you practice. I, I like that measurable aspect of it. So let's talk now a little bit about the application process. So assume that you have a great GPA and a very high DAT score, something that Columbia really heavily scrutinizes. What else goes into making a really great applicant that stands out to the admissions committee at Columbia? Good question. Specifically at Columbia, we have a really diverse class. Everyone seems to be very fun loving. So I think that personality does weigh heavily into it. Um, and and this this theme may came up, come up in further questions you ask, Joel. But I I feel like finding a dental school and 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 dental school is finding students is a lot like dating. You're both looking for a, a good fit. It's not just about can I get in or or will they accept me. You're really looking for a good fit. Um, and that and that's what the school is looking for too. So I think Columbia specifically really heavily weighs, like you said, your numbers, but they also really look at personalities, people that are fun loving, um, people that can get along well with with patients and with their classmates. And uh, yeah, they, they also have really diverse classes. We have people from all over the country. For some reason, there's a lot, of, I mean, not for some reason, there are a lot of people from New York as well, but they, they take a diverse class. So no matter your background, um, I think you have a good opportunity at getting in here if you have the numbers and, and you have a, um, a personality that fits well here. I've spent a lot of time working as you have with, with pre-dental students. And I, I think so often students, uh, they really want to like do dental, dental related things. And I think that pigeonholes you too much. Just do stuff that's interesting and stuff that you like. For example, like you, like you asked about, I, I did weird stuff. Like I worked in door-to-door -door sales for a long time and I was a web developer and I just did stuff that interested me and stuff that fell into my lap. And those were the questions I was asking about. That was like the committee. I think they remembered those things. Like that's really weird, really unique. Um, so just don't, don't feel like you need to pigeonhole yourself or do things that are only dentistry related. Yeah, absolutely. Following your interests is always a good uh, strategy. Yeah. So what's it like being a dental student at your school? I know Columbia is very different, like most schools, with the first two years compared to the second two. So maybe can you talk about what it's like in the preclinical years and then once you get into more clinical dentistry? Sure. Like you said, Columbia is, Columbia is unique in a few different ways for, for uh, applicants that don't know. It's one of the only true pass-fail schools um, in the country. There's, no, there's not even any honors. And your first two years are spent, or at least your first 18 months are spent uh, pretty heavily incorporated into the uh, medical school. So an average day in the first two years, you're going to classes at the medical school that are basically biochemistry, anatomy, genetics, kind of uh, foundational courses. And then the next, those are like the first six months. And then your next year in the medical school is, is what we call BHD, uh, body health and disease. And it body, the body and health and disease, I think is what it is. But it's it's just like all your courses on different organ systems, cardiology, renal, um, and those are all taken with a medical school. So that's, that's kind of how your mornings are spent. And then, you know, starting maybe at the three or six month mark, you start adding in a dental course here and there. So it'll be something like introduction to operative dentistry where you're learning like what exactly a, a filling looks like on various teeth. You're learning what the different teeth are, things like that. So, I mean, honestly, the first year and a half, they're difficult um, because you know, you're learning a lot of information that isn't required at every school, but at the same time, it's pass fail. You get a 70% and you pass. So it's, it's not super competitive and people can pass with, 
with effort that I would consider pretty minimal compared to people who are trying to get a, a really solid rank at a different at a different school. That's kind of how the first two years work. You'll start doing maybe at the at the year mark or maybe sooner than that, eight months to a year. You start you'll start drilling. At least that's what it was before coronavirus. You go into pre clinic, you'll drill on, type it on some plastic teeth. How do you find that the medical school education, I happen to know that you're interested in oral surgery, is going to help you later on in your career? Uh, as you said, it can be a ton of information to learn. Not every dental school has it. Say you weren't interested in oral surgery, though. Do you think that's still going to be a benefit to you? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question to ask. And I was actually surprised by how few of my classmates really thought about that before they signed up to come here. So important to think about. Like you said, I came into school knowing I was interested in oral surgery, which means for applicants that don't know, you have to take an exam that's basically the step one exam for medical students. So I would say that having the medical curriculum was, was really helpful for that um, because I was able to basically just study for the CBSE. That's the, that's the pre-oral surgery exam. I was able to just study for that and really not even pay attention to my medical school courses and still pass them because they were so well aligned. Whereas I think at other programs, you kind of have to do one or the other. You'd have to, or you have to do both rather and uh, do them both independently. So there's a huge advantage, I think, in that. But at the same time, I think, I think more of the advantage, and we can get into this more later, but one of the reasons why I think so many students specialize out of Columbia is less about having the medical school curriculum and more about uh, the amount of free time you end up with. Um, that's not to say that the, the first 18 months with the medical school aren't difficult, but you end up with a lot of free time especially if you're not studying for an oral surgery exam, it's pass fail. You don't have to study like every day. So people have lots of time to do research and things like that. Um, but, but to answer your question more directly, a lot of my classmates, when we were taking really in-depth biochemistry courses or really in-depth renal courses or like leg anatomy, they were upset. And they were like, well, I didn't, why am I learning this? Like, I don't care. And <laughs> Surprising to me because the Columbia is very upfront about it. They tell you that. So mm -hmm. if you have no interest in learning like the the nitty gritty of the entire body, then you're gonna you're going to not be happy with the curriculum. So uh, you Neil, know, can you talk a little bit about what the transition is like from first and second year into third and fourth year? How you feel like you're prepared for things and what the daily schedule is like now that you're actually starting to see patients. So in your first two years, you will have taken all your medical courses and you will have taken a preclinical course in basically every specialty. You'll have also had a preclinical course where you're working on typodonts. You're doing root canals on typodonts. You're doing, it works really well in that in those first two years, you will have done basically everything that you're going to do on patients, um, you know, on a typodont first in a preclinical simulation situation. And then, um, but you start seeing patients at that point. Um, and, and the way that they're doing third year right now, this is new as of this year. So it is subject to change, but Right now, third year students are starting in rotations. So rather than just like being given a pool of patients and you're doing whatever those patients need, you're uh, kind of introduced to the different specialties and different procedures piecemeal. So you'll have a week rotation where you're in restorative, where you're, you're taking care of the patient, you're anesthetizing them, you're doing fillings, you're taking x-rays, whatever they may need. And then the next week, you're in oral surgery, you're pulling teeth. The week after that, you're in endodontics. And depending on the specialty, like an endodontics is a third year, we don't do hardly any, you, you're assisting usually fourth years who are doing comprehensive care on patients. So once your third year's over and you've gone through all these rotations and you've, you've performed a bunch of procedures, you've met, uh, you know, you've done a certain number of each of them, then you move on to your fourth year where you're given the patients, you schedule them, you're responsible for whatever they may need. So one of the reasons that lots of students might be interested in Columbia specifically is because they've heard that there is a very high specialization rate out of the school. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what the numbers are for the graduating classes and do your best to kind of discuss why you think specialization rates are so high out of Columbia? In my class, my specific class, there are 20 or so people interested in oral surgery. There are probably 20 or so interested in orthodontics. We're a class of 80 people. So that's already half the class. Yeah. And then I'd say, you know, there, there, there are a lot of people, 10 or 15 interested in endodontics, another 10 or 15 in pediatrics. So I think a, a vast minority of my class will end up going into general dentistry. Uh, and, and the ones that do will always do a GPR first or an AGD. So basically everybody that goes here goes, goes to some residency or other. People that come here, it's kind of like a, a, a self-perpetuating cycle because 
people that want to specialize know that Columbia has a high specialty rate, so they come here and then they specialize. So I think it has actually less to do with the school than people may give it credit for. It, it definitely is selecting for itself. Like mm -hmm. I came here wanting to specialize, I'm going to specialize. Um, although that being said, one of the reasons I chose Columbia is because they do, especially in oral surgery and like orthodontics, they match a lot more people than other programs do. So, um, and, I, and I think a part of that is, like I said, we do have a lot of free time. The pass-fail curriculum, you know, frees up so much of your time and energy to not be consumed by like just trying to get three more percentage points on an exam. Mm -hmm. um, so we have lots of time to do research. It's, it's really easy to get involved in research here. Um, you know, we have lots of time to get involved in all these different programs New York City has to offer that have nothing to do with Columbia, but volunteer opportunities where you can really, you know, learn a lot and also put those on your resume for the future. So I've had time to get involved in research. I, I was given like a fellowship, kind of like scholarship to do research this summer and, and a bunch of students every year are able to qualify for that. So what closing big picture advice do you have for someone that's interested in Columbia? If you were in their shoes, Neil, what would you want to know? What advice would you have want to have been given at that time? You really need to be aware of the price tag of the school you're going to. I felt okay coming to Columbia and swallowing that cost because I knew I wasn't going to be paying extra money to go to residency. And on top of that, I felt like I knew New York had enough job opportunities. I'm married. I knew my wife could get a really good job here, and she has. So that was one of my hesitations going to even cheaper schools is like, I know my wife won't be able to get the job she's looking for. So really like you have to pay attention to price tag. So many of my classmates are like flippant about the cost and it makes me nervous for them. So I would really encourage applicants to take that serious. Um, and I'd also encourage you to like really do your research. The fact that you're watching this video is a good first step, like watch more of them, really know what you're getting yourself into because every school has downsides, but you're never going to know what they are unless you, unless you do your research. And then the last thing is, is just basically what we talked about earlier, Joel, which is like, don't get so tunnel visioned on, on dentistry. There's so much more to life than, than getting into dental school. And the, the broader your experience, the, the more unique your experience, that only serves to help you in an application process. So what are some things that students might not know about Columbia that actually are possibly not the best um, that are reasons that they might not want to go to the school? Um, I came here feeling like we are going to have world-class faculty and nobody will be able to compete with the type of education that we'll have here. And honestly, I feel like the faculty are world-class, but they're world-class in certain things. Some of them are world-class like for their research, not for their teaching. So you have to understand that like some of your teachers are going to be worse than like your undergrad teachers. Like they're going to be very good clinically. They're going to be great researchers, but they're not, they're not going to teach you as clearly as you'd hope. Um, that happens a lot. Our tests, they're pass fail, but they're also, it's a long story, kind of complicated, but they're not very well written exams, which shocked me. Um, it's an Ivy League school. You think they'd have the academics kind of down pat, but there are struggles still. And then lastly, I just say like the clinical experience, especially with coronavirus, you know, so give every school some slack. My experience, like our experience at Columbia, I'm very grateful for so far because I have friends at other places that they have like one patient a week, which is not true here. We've, we've at least been able to put in protocols and and be busy in clinic, but even even at you know uh, full capacity, we do we do less clinical work than other schools. And there's ways you can find that information. You know, we may talk about that in a minute, but we do less clinical work than other schools. That's just a fact. And if you want to do general dentistry, um, you're going to do a lot of extra academic work here. You wouldn't do at other schools, and then you'll probably do less clinical work than you would at other schools. And you'll really feel like I need to do a GPR before I can before I can go to private practice. I don't know if you felt that way about your your experience, Joel, did you feel like I'm not ready to practice dentistry? Uh, so first off, I appreciate your openness. Um, mm -hmm. When I graduated, I overall did feel pretty comfortable um, or as comfortable as you can be when you graduate from dental school because it's a huge transition going from having two and a half to three hours per uh, yeah, patient sure. to having to do something in an hour or less. Yeah. Um, I, so I can't compare to, to other programs, but for what I experienced at the University of Toronto, Overall, I felt pretty good. I did end up actually graduating and going to a very remote area where I was the only dentist there. Um, and so I don't think I would have done that had I not felt a degree of confidence yeah, sure. um, in myself. And, uh, but every program does have its strengths and limitations. 
And I think it's great that you're talking about this openly because it's something that not enough students consider when they're choosing which program they want to go to. You made a reference earlier in the interview about how it's like dating. Well, the next step after dating is marriage. And when you choose to go to dental school, 99% of the time, there's no do-overs. That's the school that you're going to go to. That's the school that you're going to graduate from. Um, you can do GPRs and AGDs if you want to have additional training. But for the most part, this is the bulk of your dental education. And so trying to find out what are the strengths and limitations of the program is really important. The University of Toronto, I felt pre pretty good clinically, but there were, you can ask any student and they'll give you a laundry list of things that the school could have improved on. I think for the most part, my school, U of T is trying to improve on those things, but it's a slow process. So I actually happened to know that you had been working on a new project to try and allow students to get a little bit more inside information as to what it's like to go to dental school and graduate programs. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that now because I think sure. giving students more information is super valuable. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's called gradschoolgrades.com. Uh, it's an idea I had a while ago, which I mean, it, it's exactly what you just talked about. I got into school. I love certain things about Columbia. And then I also was like, well, this is a problem. Why didn't anybody tell me about this when I was interviewing here? Like no students mentioned it even. You know, you have your interview day, you talk to students. No one said you know, watch out for this. If you don't like this, don't come here. Um, and like I said, I would not do anything different. I'm, I'm so happy with my decision, but I'm happy with it for reasons that other people would be very unhappy with. So uh, yeah, gradschoolgrades.com is a website where we have worked really hard. We've gathered uh, written reviews from students at every dental school in the country and some in Canada. And uh, they basically write a two-page review about their program that talks about the pros and the cons. And uh, the reason that it's so valuable is because their anonymity is protected. So I know that they actually go to that school so you can be sure that they're not making stuff up, but their anonymity is protected so that they feel comfortable enough to really talk about what they wish they'd known. And, uh, you know, I think there are so many benefits to what we offer, but one of the main ones is just a, an upfront financial uh, savings. Um, when you're applying to school, like I applied to, I think, 13 programs. and I did a lot of work. I called people at every school. I tried to find a connection. So I had some reason to apply there. But I talked to so many students who were like, I don't know, like I'm applying to Columbia because it's in New York and that sounds fun. And that's, you know, it's, it's like $130 per school. You're just throwing away. And then on top of that, if you get invited for an interview and, you know, if it wasn't coronavirus, you're flying, you're staying, it's like $1,000 for an interview. So we charge, you know, we, we charge some, some, uh, price to get access to these reviews but if it can save you from applying to one or two schools just because like you like the location it's going to save you a ton of money a ton of time and it could help you find your dream school and, and avoid making like making a terrible decision like you said getting locked into a school that you're like wow I really regret this yeah and um, even in this interview I debate as to whether I should ask you what are some of the less desirable parts about going to Columbia and it's because there is a degree of hesitance on most students um, especially publicly to talk about these are the things that maybe you wouldn't have thought about that aren't uh, rosy about our school. So I really do think that's a valuable resource and students should definitely check it out because uh, again, if you're going to get married, married, you don't want to get divorced. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so you definitely want to know who you're uh, getting into a household with. So I think that's well, an you, awesome thing. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. You don't want to, you don't want to marry a stranger. So this, this site just gives students a chance to get to know the school before they apply. Um, it's called gradschoolgrades.com. We actually have uh, we posted it on the bootcamp Facebook page a while back. You guys were generous enough to let us kind of get some initial exposure there. And, and we still have a promo code with bootcamp. So promo code bootcamp, I think it's, it's our biggest promo code. It's like 40% off. And uh, it's also been our most popular, our most popular promo code. So if, if any students are out there trying to get a little more information, I know acceptances are coming up. You're going to have to make a tough decision. So I'd encourage you to use that, use that resource. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Parker. This was super informative. Uh, you know a ton about the school, you spoke about it very well, and I think you've given students a very complete picture as to what it's like to be a student there. And if anyone has any further questions for Parker specifically, go to gradschoolgrades.com. You can shoot a message. I'm sure he'd be happy to help you out. Yeah, thanks a bunch, Joel. Appreciate it. Okay, take care. All right, see ya. So if you like this video, I have a completely online video course helping students to prepare for their health professional school interviews. It's called Roadmap Prep. You can find it at roadmapprep.com. So go check out roadmapprep.com. There's over two hours of free videos. I have a whole module just on medical ethics. I think you're going to like it.